Hi, this is J.D. Ingram of the Charleston Pipe Band, and I want to welcome you to my series on how to be a great piper in three steps. As a refresher, here is the tree diagram for our three easy steps. Stay tuned as we dive into today's topic. Lesson three of three, using pulsing or phrasing to create musical expression. So what do I mean by creating phrasing using terms like light and shade, pulsing, or phrasing? Well, pulsing, phrasing, or light and shade is a method of creating your own flavor of musical expression. And it's really should be reserved to be the final little nuance that you build into your playing. Some skills that we can practice to enable ourselves to put light and shade or phrasing in our music is understanding which beats are the more important beats, coming up with a strategy ahead of time on how we're going to pulse the important beats, which notes are the key notes in those beats, and then creating space within those beats without actually making the tempo change, allowing that beat to, to create more space by just simply overlapping a little bit. We'll talk about the rude person on an airplane analogy. The drills, the only way to really do this is to study your music and determine if there's a structure that can be emphasized and then go through and practice your music with these specific notes held a little bit more or cut a little bit more or played just a little bit early or a little bit late in order to create a sense of phrasing and ensuring that you are not overdoing it by managing your rhythmic control. Okay, so expression, right? There's this whole nebulous idea of what makes music music, right? The um, adding uh, your own little flavor, pulsing, light and shade. You hear these things in uh, pipers who uh, oftentimes I think are probably great pipers, but not such great teachers will say, oh, you didn't have quite enough, you know, lift or, or light. Light and shade is a really common one I hear. Uh, and there's, there's no real explanation about how to do that or what that even really means. Um, and so, Kind of what I have found is the objective kind of mathematical way that you can approach this and, and kind of add things to it is one, study the music, know what the rules are, and then identify a couple places where you're going to maybe break the rules a little bit. Um, and so what I mean by that is uh, study the music, first of all. So uh, I've printed us out a copy of Scott and the Brave. I'll put a copy up for you to screenshot if you want. Use the sheet music, pause real quick, take a screenshot, and then let's get back to it. And then um, let's go through it together. Uh, talking through it on, uh, let's say, the first, first two beats, right? We can start right from the very beginning of the tune. One thing you do to kind of add a little bit of emphasis, a little oomph, is a pulse, the first beat of a phrase, of a line, of a part. Um, and so the very first beat of the tune, that low A, right? You've got a quarter note on low A. If we're doing this in a march idiom, that, that tends to be fairly understated. Um, a couple ways that you might do it is take the Torlua, which traditionally ends on the beat, right? Low G-based embellishments are going to eat into the note before them. So that Torlua is going to eat into that first low A. Um, and maybe you tighten that Torlua up so it eats less of that low A. That low A uh, then gets bigger, right? And thus has, uh, because you've adjusted how you're playing the Torlua, maybe feels feels a little more important than it did if you played a big fat Torlua. Uh, if we were doing a strass bay, the rules for adding even more lift to it are, are kind of pushed to the extremes on, especially on a beat one. So you could even take that and break the rule of ending the torlo on the beat and start the torlo on the beat, right? So that low A takes up the entire first beat 
and you don't start that low G of the Torloa until beat two is occurring, right? And so now the Torloa is eating into beat two and uh, making the second low A shorter and thus feel less important, right? So uh, I'm gonna mark that on the page and kind of circle uh, right here. Let's look at it together. So here's just one way you can notate it. I highlighted the low A and noted bigger, and I noted the Torlua moves to the right as way as just a reminder that when I'm playing off of this piece of paper, this is what I'm gonna do. You could also put a color coding system with a highlighter if you wanted, uh, any sort of notation. Looking at some places where we can adjust that. Further on, um, in the traditional structure of a tune, right? Tunes are typically set up in two bar phrases with two phrases per line, kind of a question phrase and an answer phrase, and then two lines per part, or sometimes one line that's repeated. Uh, so the next place that we might look to add a little bit of oomph to Scott and the Brave would be the uh, first beat of bar three, right? This, the second phrase. So that D throw, a lot of times that D throw uh, if you're starting it on the beat, that D throw is eating into the D. Some ways that you can maybe add some oomph to the D is start that D throw just a touch early, right? We could do the take the same notes. So let's look at that sheet music together. I made basically the same edits as I did at the beginning, but here I noted D throw and F both go away from the D to give that D extra space in the part. You could take the D throw, slide it forward a little bit, make that D as big as possible, and you could maybe just be the faintest bit late to the F, right? Uh, and to make that D as, as big as possible. This would interrupt the actual flow if you're playing for a drummer, uh, but if you were playing this as a Strass Bay and for a dancer, giving them a little bit of extra time and a little extra emphasis on that beat one could, um, you know, Give, uh, give that extra little hint of lift. So um, some playing examples. The first uh, two beats we talked about, a very unmusical, unlifted example of the first, let's say three or four beats of the tune. Right? And the, the first thing we talked about two videos ago was adding uh, dots and cuts to their extreme. That's already better. The next thing we talked about was combining the dots and cuts into, or the cuts into adjacent embellishments. So making that short B part of the C doubling. Which is really kind of just adds a little bit more to the dots and cuts as long as possible and as short as possible. And then what we're talking about here is maybe breaking the rules a little bit on embellishments to add some pulse especially to a beat one of a bar or phrase or line. Um, sometimes also to a beat three, kind of a strong week, medium week, that's especially applicable in strass bass, but it's not entirely inapplicable to marches, jigs, reels, etc. So to do that in Scotland the Brave as a march, we could go. Right? Um, so that the way I expressed the tour lua especially was just a little tighter than maybe I expressed the C doubling um, to add some oomph to that first low A. The exact same progression in B, uh, bar three, so coming from that low A. All right, first add the dot and cut. Fusion of that short D into the C doubling, kind of the same thing. And then adding this pulsing a little bit. Right? See how I held that D? Maybe just a little bit longer than I probably should have um, if I was playing this purely regimental march, you know, force march down the road parade. Uh, and that would be only if it really I was doing this kind of as an exhibition piece, right? Where I'm trying to kind of show off my musical chops here. Um, and that's another thing to think about is what's your purpose for playing? 
If you're playing for a parade, light and shade, probably not so important. If you're playing for an exhibition, show off your musical chops, competition, uh, not that you would probably submit competition, uh, Scott on the Brave, as a competitive tune, but if you did, for some reason, those are some things that you could do to make it a little, little livelier. Um, if we were going to take the exact same music as Scott on the Brave, the exact same notes, and play it as a Strass Bay, um, the first bar we could really exaggerate. Right? You probably wouldn't have even notes. You would have dots and cuts uh, in every single beat. So I'm playing those, uh, what is traditionally an even C doubling to low A and C doubling up to E at the end of the first bar as uh, tacums, because uh, that's probably what they would be if this was a Strass Bay. And you hear, I really lean into that first low A, slide that tour loa into beat two. getting a whole a lot more emphasis than it would if it was a, a march and certainly more than if I was playing in a break. So that's a way to kind of take the same music and liven it up a little bit. And you could do this with any tune. You could do it with your, your solo marches, uh, it's your solo reels, your solo strass bass. All three of those idioms are absolutely rife with opportunities to go kind of identify just one or two important notes, identify adjacent embellishments, and maybe play those embellishments a little tighter than you would normally, or tighter than the embellishments around them, to show this beat's important, because we can't play it louder, we can't play it softer, we can't accent it, we can't tongue it like you would on a, a trumpet or a trombone, or a flute or a clarinet. Uh, all we can do is play it a little earlier, a little later, a little longer, a little shorter, right? Um, and so, making it stand out against its peers by playing it slightly longer, slightly shorter, uh, really, that's, that's what we've got. And so that's, that's kind of what you do. Um, that being said, it's, uh, it's, it's like, like adding a really spicy pepper to your music. You want to only add just a little bit. Pick out one or two notes, maybe the first beat of each bar, maybe just the first beat of each line. Um, cause if you get to the point where you're every sing, every other note is noticeably longer than the notes around it, it just kind of sounds like you can't control your tempo, uh, that you're, you're all over the place. And so that's why this is the last of the videos about expression. If you, if you're looking to, to add expression, say first step is make sure you're consistent to the beat and you're expressing those dots and cuts as much as possible. And that's probably a fine place to stop. If you are looking to, you know, really differentiate yourself beyond that, do the fusion. And only when you've expressed that you are, have everything under control, you're probably at this point, you know, a upper level grade three player, maybe grade two, maybe even grade one. Uh, and you're, you're trying to differentiate yourself from your peers. That's when, and you at this point, hopefully have, shown that you can control your tempos and your, your embellishments and stuff, that's when you start breaking the rules. Um, just, just like like in, in any art form, uh, there's you know the, the rules of good construction and stuff like that. Uh, uh, an absolute novice will say, oh, I could go paint that abstract piece of art, just throw, throw artwork at, at a, or you know, throw paint at a canvas. And sure, it looks like that to, to most people, but to an expert, it just looks random. Uh, unless you have demonstrated beforehand that you can do it perfect and that you're purposely maybe doing it a little a little off to, to prove a point. Um, and that's really that's really the whole thing here. So um, your homework, if you're if you're watching this video and you've been told that you need to add more light and shade or more musical expression to your tunes. Uh, and you already have mastered what we've talked about in the last couple of videos, your next step is go through your music, print you out a copy, and uh, highlight uh, one or two beats per line 
or, or phrase that you're going to just lean into a little bit more. And um, by that, I mean, play the, the dot and cut or the uh, related embellishments a little tighter than, than ones around them. And maybe, maybe, maybe play the whole beat just a, a hint longer than the ones around it. So um, that's really all I've got for you. We don't have a drill for you. We don't have um, any sort of sheet, uh, you know, wrote uh, fundamental exercise. We're not playing arpeggios or anything. You just got to look at the music that you're trying to express better, identify how you're going to do it academically, and then practice that. So that's it, guys. Take care. Thanks again for tuning in this week, guys. As a refresher, we've been talking about of our three steps for how to be a great bagpiper. Step one, have good finger work. Part three, play with musicality. And of that, subpart three, create phrasing using light and shade. Take care, guys.